we'll have the final panel discussion, followed by some final remarks, closing remarks from Tembiza Fakuda. The next panel discussion is looking at non-racialism and multiculturalism, a dream deferred is the title. It's my pleasure to invite up to the podium the moderator of this next panel session. Let's extend a warm hand to Rafael Haber, co-founder and executive director of the Common Action Forum. Let's welcome him. Hello, good morning, good actually, good afternoon, I'm sorry. Uh, jet lag is complicated sometimes to be handled. Uh, Sami, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you very much for, the, uh, for our local team here, organizers, especially to uh, Tembisa Fakude. And uh, thank you for everyone who just attended the event and uh, who will now join us for this uh, third and uh, last panel called uh, Non-Rationalism uh, and uh, Multiculturalism, uh, Deferred Dream. Uh, this is our very last panel and uh, I think we uh, have the chance to uh, at least keep the level of the former ones which were uh, really uh, good and uh, they brought us very important thoughts about the current state of our world nowadays. Uh, I am a sociologist, but I'm also a geographer. So for me, it's very interesting to see the topic that we are discussing right now, which is uh, uh, race and culture. Uh, so 15,000 years ago, we wouldn't have the chance to have this conversation for many reasons. But the main reason is that all communities were living already in our entire planet. So we had human beings living in all continents, but they had no connections to each other. The connections started to happen, at least uh, in, uh, for our Western uh, knowledge, 500 years ago, which is actually a very short time. So when we talk about this sort of crisis, I don't think it's uh, something uh, very impressive. Actually, uh, this is the normality we have to face now, uh, how human beings have developed in different places. And unfortunately, there were relations of powers that uh, were established in a very asymmetric way and uh, generated actually uh, very bad events in our history. So if we talk about the slavery that uh, fed uh, Latin America until the end of the 19th century. So it was probably the most uh, horrible thing that happened in our human history. Um, so of course, I mean, if we come uh, more closely to our times and we talk about the Enlightenment, about the French Revolution, about the Industrial Revolution, of course we have uh, many beautiful things to be happy, but uh, we also generated during this time uh, sort of official representatives of our world, uh, let's say science. Uh, when uh, you take, for example, these uh, expeditions from Europeans coming to Africa, uh, it was very common that anthropologists were here in each and every expedition because they needed to create and to generate an object of analysis which was the people who lived here. And they were objectified. And they were actually put in a very uh, hard condition in this uh, relation of power. So if we are talking now about non-racialism, it's basically because we face this uh, time in history. Uh, and uh, the good news is that now we have all the elements and all the tools and all the apparatus to change it, or at least to get another level of uh, consciousness uh, and understand exactly what is our role in this planet and uh, what is this thing called multiculturalism or identities. Uh, and that's why we have today here our speakers. And uh, I will uh, introduce them, uh, not everyone by now, I will uh, introduce now our first speaker who is uh, Cheru Carolus. Cheru was with us already in Madrid in uh, other opportunities. And uh, Cheru is the executive member of the board of International Crisis Group, former South African High Commissioner to the United Kingdom. And uh, she served as the National Executive Committee 
of uh, the African National Congress, the governing party in South Africa. Cheryl, please. Thank you, Raphael. I, you've left out a few things in my resume, which are things that I'm very proud of, that I was one of the most accurate stone throwers in uh, Cape Town, certainly, <laughs> at one stage in my life. Uh, I joined my first political organization when I was 13, so I used to be properly a young person who was pretty fearless and certainly wasn't holding back for any of the old people around the place. So I am just astounded that young people seem to think that they should wait for old people to die or step out of the way. I mean, like, what's happened to the fearlessness of youth here, you know? I mean, but maybe they don't make them like they used to. <laughs> but I, I do want to pick up on some of the, the, the bits that came out in, our earlier convers in the earlier conversation by the earlier contributors. Um, the, and, and if we look at the fact that all of us, when we look at, I was saying to Muhammad, you know, we made this country properly ungovernable. And we were kids, we were like in our 20s. And we really brought apartheid to a standstill. We made it totally unworkable with uh, very little global support. I remember famously Maggie Thatcher had a quote where she said, anybody who thinks that Nelson Mandela will be the president of South Africa and that the ANC will rule South Africa is living in cloud cuckoo land. Well, famous words, as they say. So if we think about the journey of you know, the, the topic we're looking at about uh, non-racialism, even the very need for talking about non-racialism presupposes that there's racism. And I think the South, Af the South African story is one that says non-racialism is not just a dream come true. There's a journey. Uh, the 27th of April that gave us a constitution that is one of the most modern ones in the world, the South African constitution, did not come about as an event. Even the process towards it, the people who sat around that table, but I, I won't go into the rest of it. And my first assertion is that, you know, we, we had racism, and in South Africa it wasn't just institutionalized racism, it was actually legalized racism. And I think there's a big difference that people sometimes just overlook. There was a time when it was illegal to teach maths and science to the vast majority of South Africans, because there was a big picture. And then the journey towards non-racialism had to necessitate a journey of anti-racism. And when we talk about the dream deferred, I, I think it's, I thought about it quite a lot, uh, Tembisa. And I thought, what did we think that on the 27th of April, when we have the most progressive constitution in the world, that we're suddenly going to be deracialized. And that in fact, and I think it's part of what we faced with as a South African nation because we find ourselves again having to look at where we are, the, f the fees must fall, the whole roads must fall thing, and where not just young people, there were also academics at these institutions who were supporting young people in that um, Society, elements of society was in fact uh, supporting young people in saying, you know, the, the whole concept of anti-colonialism. And do we see that as a failure or as a deferment of the dream? Well, I wouldn't like non-racialism to just be a dream. It's actually a reality that people died for in this country. But it's not something, it's going to have to be something that's built deliberatively. And recently, uh, I was speaking with some, some uh, people who are much younger than I am. And one of them encapsulated very poignantly for me. She said, you know, what we got wrong was we thought Mandela had to complete a 100-meter sprint. And that was it. Well, it wasn't a sprint in the first place. It's actually one hell of an ultramarathon. But it's also an ultramarathon that has to be run in relays. Because if you think what Mandela, and, oh sorry, let me just finish what she said. And she said, and the trickiest part of any relay, she's an athlete, is that moment when you hand over the baton. You can be disqualified, 
You can drop the baton and you can lose those critical things. If you get the hand over in it, I also used to be an athlete, and I understood exactly what you meant because if you don't start running and hit the deck running, so by the time the handover happens, you have to be running at the same speed that the person who's giving you the baton should be going. And some of, and it was very, it, it helped me to understand quite a lot about what we're grappling with in South Africa because we had become a bit unstuck. So, so let me get back to the, to the racism thing. As I said, in South Africa we had legalized racism. I think of why I joined the struggle at the age of 13. I'm appalled to think that a young person should, that a kid should at the age of 13 decide to actually consciously join a struggle where people were being killed. And I don't want, I want to build a country where no child at the age of 13 ever feels they have to do that. But if I think of why I did that, I did that because, and of course now I can sort of theorize it, it was the only way that I could retain my dignity as a poor black girl child. And all of those elements, where the whole system was trying to make me complicit in my own oppression. Because and, uh, there's, some of you may know uh, the, the wonderful uh, political leader we had in our country called Steve Biko. And that whole year, I was part of the black consciousness movement. I still think it was one of the most definitive moments or periods in my life to actually be able to identify myself positively and to move on beyond black, the politics of black consciousness. But it was the only way that I could resist and refuse to be complicit in my own oppression was to identify myself not as a negative, as a non-white, which the system classified me as, but to identify myself positively as a black person. And so, I think that whole era is something that is a little bit missing now, that maybe people could uh, use a bit more of in, in the world today. But I also think in that sense of blackness, some people think we overlooked the, within that, so, so when you talk about non-racialism, I think it's about identity politics and the politics of othering the majority. Because racism, like sexism, but racism in particular, is always invoked as a tool of oppression of a minority in terms of subjugating a minority, a majority. And one of the key things is that you, part of the majority, has to buy into it. And today, I think, where I do want to agree very strongly with the, the earlier panel of younger leaders, is to say that, you know, you need to shake up the house. Every, play, every major step change, whether it's in South Africa, whether it's globally, came about through people shaking up the house. Remember, Nelson Mandela wasn't always an old person. He was actually a young Turk. He was a proper wild young person in this country, and they formed the ANC Youth League to shake up the ANC. And so it is globally. Our generation, in how we shook up the ANC and the political leadership in the country, people like Mohammed, Shan, myself. And so, but when we look at identity politics today, you can be black, you can be a woman, you can be a mother, you can be a lesbian, you can be a practicing Christian, all in one person. What's your identity? So, so when we talk about just being black, some people think we messed it up a bit by the sort of blacking ourselves. And I don't have such, it's a very a very modernist, old-fashioned way of looking at yourself and identity politics. And I think it's a question of how we take that, your sense of self, further, and how you identify yourself within that. And I'm not going to go into more of it because I, I thought maybe we should, as a panel, instill some discipline amongst ourselves to be short so that we can, especially because it's a concluding session, so that people can have a chance to speak out. But I think that many of the labels of identity is hopelessly outdated as well. And how people identify, self-identify, are identified by others 
So including this concept of race and, and, and therefore non-racialism and our sense of what is dated and not dated is, is actually a bit of a problem. And I think we need some serious shaking up of the house. And we need to accept that, especially in South Africa, now that we're formally a proper democracy, politics is driven of necessity by conservatism. And that's why we need to keep on shaking up the house. That, and the last thing I want to say is when you shake up the house, you don't shake up the house for the sake of shaking up the house. And I see Tuman is not here now. But I think whether it was the Arab Spring or whether it was the fallest movement in South Africa, a fundamental weakness in those movements has been the lack of building proper organizational structures that's rooted in your community. Because change in a society doesn't happen just because you have a few firebrands who might have the best ideas. The fire and the litmus test we were subjected to, the reason why some of us live and survive today is because the communities from where we came embraced embrace those ideas and made them their own. You cannot have a strong worker movement if you don't belong to a trade union. You cannot have a strong student movement if you don't build the SRC. You cannot have a strong uh, movement around women's equality if you don't have a strong gender and women's movement. And I think that's been one of the where they dropped the baton. They actually didn't build structures that would institutionalize the struggles that they won, and hence it's easier to roll it back. And I think it's a real risk that we need to think of uh, globally as well. Many thanks, Cheryl. <laughs> Our next panelist is Nisham Balton. He is executive director uh, of Ahmed uh, Kathrada Foundation, and uh, he has been involved in community and uh, political activism for the past 35 years with involvement ranging from teachers' unionism, civic organizations, youth activism, and formal and underground ANC activism. Please, Nishan. Thank you very much and greetings to everybody. The reason why I wanted Cheryl to speak first was that what's not mentioned in her profile also that she was the DS Deputy Secretary General of the ANC, the main driver of non-racialism in this country who has the biggest responsibility of, of taking that, that, that particular aspect of our struggle forward. And, and my contribution here is, is, is very simple, that I think, as Cheryl is saying, that the, 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 the title, I think there's a misnomer. Um, this non-racialism was not only a dream, uh, was a vision, was an aspiration, but was also a, a way of organizing. Mm -hmm. Um, for, for many involved mm -hmm. in the struggle at the time. To counter the racialized nature of apartheid, um, activist organizations very deliberately chose to then develop a, 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 a conceptualization which was the antithesis of apartheid, which was to, to work towards the establishment of a future where race, racialization, racism would not feature in the day-to-day -day living realities of people in that particular country. But in the way in which the struggle for the attainment of that, of, of that objective was, was to actually start creating the, the, the elements of that new society. So organizations themselves cross race, class, cultural, religious barriers to start creating the possibilities of the new. And I, and I think that's why it was, it's not, it's not, it was more than a dream. W were, were forms of experiment at a time when even experimentation had its own dangers. So, so, so the title talks about um, a, 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 a deferred dream. Deferred would also assume that it's something you just put in the, in the, in the, in the parking lot for a while and you can pull it back. I would rather want to contend that what, what we actually have um, is, is that a, a, a deliberate 
abandonment of a particular vision and principle at a particular time in our history. And, and for very obvious reasons at, at a later point in time, because the choice that people faced in the 1940s, 50s was do we develop an inclusionary or exclusionary form of nationalism in this country? The ANC took the route or the Congress movement that what you need was an inclusive nationalism in this country that um, took on board all of the people who were resident in this country. It had to make a very difficult political decision in 1959 after having adopted the Freedom Charter in 1955, which caused a, a portion of the movement to split. But that was a clear intention of where it stood. Um, unfortunately, the, um, the embedded nature of non-racialism suffered huge blows. So 1955, the ANC moves in, into this direction adopts the Freedom Charter. By 1965 years later, it is banned. Uh, so it's something that its leadership, by and large, would have embraced, section of its rank and file membership, but not at, at, a, at a broader mass level. We, 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 we get then into an exile period where a huge part of the organization debates whether or not membership should be opened. And it's only in 1969 that the ANC opens membership to all, to, 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 to all South Africans, but not for the leadership component. Now I'm raising this because I think that the, this contrasts in a huge way with the way in which the struggle in this country unfolds the late 70s and throughout the 80s. In the struggle of the 80s, you have cross-racial solidarity uh, against the apartheid state in, in a very organized way. And the grassroots uh, movements are in fact established around this. But by 1985-86, you have a state of emergency, again a huge clampdown. And, and again, this um, practice of non-racialism, its rootedness is again weakened substantially. But we get to 1990, uh, the constitutional drafting process, again, is one that is widely inclusive. But there is where I think we, we start making perhaps huge mistakes. Uh, we, we draft a constitution that has the most wonderful preamble. And the constitution says we must recognize the injustices of our past. It calls on all South Africans to do that. And this is the in my view, one of the first mistakes in terms of building a non-racial consciousness is that we actually don't do the kind of work that is practical in this regard. So the, the idea that I, the example that I share with people all over, at the end of the Second World War, Eisenhower opens up the concentration camps across Germany, he invites German citizens to come and see the mass graves of Jews in, in, in those countries. And he says, well, this is what you've helped to create. In my mind, and it, 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 it might, I might be off, but that created a basis for Germans, although it took 20 years later, to start grappling with reconciliation in a way that the, the, that the past was, was understood to, to a certain extent. We didn't do this. Which is why today we have a fundamental problem where large sections of our society actually don't understand what apartheid was, what this country was in 1994, what in fact it inherited, and what the obligations are of all of its citizens now. Where the result is that you will have those who were extremely privileged by their past, who today think that the inheritance that they've received over, over the centuries doesn't require of them to do much more. But I don't think it's only the problem of, of, of white people in this country. I think it's the, it's the lack of engagement, is the lack of clarity on what exactly needs to be done in forms of redress that are sustainable and long-term here. So, so there are huge gaps in that regard. But we also then talk about 
um, recognizing those who suffered from justice and, and freedom in our land. So, so the Constitution and the preamble, in, in, my, in, in, my, in my view, laid the basis for deepening aspects of non-racial work in this country. And that laid, it, it created the basis for reconciliation work to almost start and end with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Rather than seeing the, the reconciliation work in this country as part of a long-term process. Again, we, we go through the hearings, we go through the trauma, and, and we almost stop. Because there's no coherent program around nation building. There's no coherent program as to who needs to do what, who must give up what, who must contribute what. And unless we deal with that, we open up the spaces for all kinds of people to try to determine their gender. In, in, in the positives for, 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 for this country, when I looked at the issue of multiculturalism, which we were asked to talk about, again, it's a contested uh, notion and, and there are variants of it. Stuart Hall is perhaps the best proponent of unpacking the different um, interpretations of, of, of multiculturalism. It can be a very conservative tool. It could also potentially be liberating. Now, you have situations, at least in this country here, uh, I, I think on issues of culture, of language, of race, or, or rather of religion, tolerance is perhaps the best way to describe it. Not broadly acceptance, but I've, I, I'm, I've been very pleased if you look at the celebrations of Diwali, of Eid, and other kinds of, of, of celebrations here, there's widespread appreciation. Okay, there's some unhappiness about fireworks and so forth around Diwali, but I think that that, that, that is an issue that we must grapple with. There have been instances of intolerance, uh, throwing of pig's heads in mosques and what have you, but I would want to argue that as much as there is Islamophobia, it is not a widespread phenomenon in this country. And that's partly because I think the involvement of people of all races and religions in the struggle for freedom in this country, it just didn't come about. So multiculturalism itself is something that would have to be worked towards. It's not something that I think we can just prescribe. Fortunately, the, our approach here in terms of dealing with cultures, 11 languages are recognized, uh, r r r Twelve. Twelve. Twelve is fine. Well, I don't know if the constitution's been amended. <laughs> uh, so, but but I, I think you can, you can see that the, the scope of tolerance in the country itself. Unlike France, you don't you 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 come in here you assimilate into French mm. culture. So the burqa is out. In South Africa, I don't think we've had those kinds of experiences. Although we don't take it for granted. I think uh, Chumani's outfit was powerful indicator of this today. However, had he been on the Gauw train a week or two ago, he probably would not have been allowed on because the workers on that Gauw train have been told people only allow people who are decently dressed. <laughs> and by decent, we would have Western norms and standards. And they threw this particular person off. They didn't allow him to go onto the train. So there's a huge amount of work still to be done in that regard. But there are also fundamental policy issues that I don't think we've thought through really clearly. The notions of e equity and equality which underpin non-racialism, we've not understood, or we've not got South Africans to understand. So to get into medical school today, young people of different race groups have to have different levels of, of, of educational attainment. Now, I can accept that. I can justify it. I can, I can explain it from the point of equity. But I don't think there's ever been a national conversation where we explain why this needs to be done and for how long it will have to be done. So, th and that cuts across a range of service provision issues within the state where I think the issue of non-racialism and a non-racial approach to the delivery of services is something that I think public servants don't understand. 
So the allocation studies that we've done on the allocation of houses to poor people across race, public servants will only look at one criteria, and that is race itself. Not class, not income, or anything else. So RDP homes, where we've, in, where we've, we, we've gone and we, we did a small study, it's a huge battle to get the city of Joburg at the time, which was run by the ANC, to allocate a percentage of homes to people who are not African. Ultimately, it was the fact that it, it was close to a local government election that they thought it prudent to bring people in, but done in a way that the non-African uh, recipients were made to feel so unwelcome by the officials that within a year or two, the bulk of them left. Contrast that to another city in, in, in Mohale, where there the political party, which again the ANC, takes a very different approach, organizes the African community to take in poor white, uh, poor, poor, poor white housing recipients. Today, those white residents are there, they speak the language, they serve on all of the structures in those areas, and they are completely integrated. Now, those are the challenges. I don't even want to talk about education in all range of areas, because non-racialism in the, in the in, in post-apartheid South Africa has very different challenges, and to conclude, it's beyond the issues of race. It's about building a broadly inclusive society, issues of gender, issues of nationality, issues of sexual preference. All of those issues would now have to, to, to feature into broadly what you would call a non-racial inclusive society. Because unless we do that, we're stuck on the formulations of the past, which today I think no, which, which would have to be broadened much more extensively for, 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 for its relevance in post-apartheid South Africa. Nishan, thank you very much. You. Now, our next panelist, uh, everybody knows him already, Mr. Dangor. He was a former ambassador uh, to, the, to Libya and Saudi Arabia and other several countries. Please, Mr. Dangor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, before we came up here, Shan said to me, if you speak first, uh, I'll say I agree with whatever you say. So I'm <laughs> going to say I agree with whatever Shan <laughs> said. However, having said that, what I do most about Cheryl is going to London and not feeding, uh, feeding me fish and chips. She used to do that very regularly. Um, having said that, I think the ANC was formed in 1912. And the intention was to unite the tribes at that particular point in time. It was an important issue uh, to actually combat the colonial powers and the colonial thinking and the foreign powers that came to the soil of South of Africa. It opened up, as Shan had said, to the broader groupings of South Africans at the Cabway Conference and the question of non-racialism, non-sexism, uh, and democracy was always the ANC's and the leadership of the ANC's objectives. I can recall growing up uh, the sounds of non, uh, irrespective of race, color or creed, which was our common saying amongst each other. Having said that, I think one part of the challenges we now have to pick up in this particular era is the question of identity politics and how we actually deal with that. I was at a meeting in the Western Cape not too long ago with the leaders of what they call themselves the First Nation leadership tribal leadership, the Korana, the Nama, and as they call themselves, the Bushmen, we didn't actually accept that connotation in the past. Uh, but they said, A, we are Africans. You are denying our Africanness by calling us colored in this racial classification that we've carried over from the apartheid past. We are the First Nations, and we are making a First Nation claim as such. But importantly, they said, we are Africans. And if we recall the statement by former President Mbeki when he accepted the Constitution, where he included all the people, the Boers, uh, even the Berbers, uh, the Indians, the Malays, 
uh, with Koza, all of them in his definition of African was there, and it's, it's a seminal statement of the ANC, I think, that you need to take forward. But the other questions and the challenges that we do have is that separatist movements are opportunistic. Separatist movements will be used by people for their own ends. If I listen to, the, to King Zuelatini at this particular point in time, I actually become a bit worried. What is King Zuelatini talking about a separate state in KwaZulu-Natal? When I hear people in the Western Cape now calling for a referendum for a separate state in the Western Cape, I say to myself, are the separatists now becoming emboldened? How are we going to deal with that? And I think the, the, the notion, and I think the narrative should still be that of non-racialism, non-sexism, and democracy in South Africa. Anything else is a recipe for disaster. It will actually break us up into can cantons, it will break us up into separate things, and I will experience in South Africa what I experienced in Libya, where people use default lines to gain their own objectives and for their own reasons. So this is why, as a movement, as a people, as South Africans, the question of non-racialism, non-sexism, and democracy is an important underpinning thing. But the question of language. Some of the issues that we've picked up uh, in some of the schools where there have been protests about the appointment of particular teachers. And we, some of us have gone into those communities, and those communities were SACOS. Now, the, the South African Council of Sport was, in fact, to the left of the ANC. They were part of the unity movement. Um, and those schools had opened their doors many years ago to all races, to everybody, in defiance of the South African government. Why would those schools now go and protest when a teacher is appointed? It is because we have not actually dealt with the language question effectively. And we need to deal with the language question. We've said yes, there are 11 languages. We have not said how we're going to actually implement that particular portion of the Constitution. We have to do that work and look at that very carefully to ensure that no opportunists come involved to actually separate people once again uh, and to block transformation because of their own personal ends. Having said that, we need to look at what, and I and now to go back to the so-called Arab Spring, what has made people the other? In Libya, the other was because you lived in a, ge in a different geographical uh, area. In Syria, it was your, your sect, your religion, and when I lived there, it was a tolerant society in Syria. In fact, it went beyond tolerance. There was a, a scholar, a Sunni scholar called Ramadan al Buti, who once said to me, you know, yeah, we go beyond tolerance. We recognize each other's right to be different. And that, I think, is important for us to also recognize each other's right to be different within the collective, within the whole. Because unless we guard against that, people will use it, they will abuse it for their own ends to get to political agendas that may not be of the local people. That will be agendas of other people elsewhere who actually want to achieve different ends, regime change. We've seen the, the, the difficulties in India since the last election. We've now seen the difficulties in Brazil uh, since the recent election. And the question there is what's going to happen to the question of the color line in Brazil becomes important. It's not only the ideological bend that's going to happen there. What does that mean for BRICS? Does it mean that BRICS is going to survive uh, in the way it has as a counterbalance to the Western influence or the American influence? I think not. So when we look at issues, we need to look at the international sphere, break it down and bring it to the regional sphere, and bring it to the local, because there are interests involved in every one of those spheres, and we need to be careful and be vigilant that those spheres are not used against the people, and importantly, we need to re-emphasize the non-racialism, non-sexism, and democracy of our country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Danger.
Now our final panelist is Michael Amwa. He is visiting fellow at the Ferris Lagi Center for Africa, Institute of Global Affairs uh, at the London School of Economics. He is specializes in foreign policy and diplomacy, international political economy, international relations, politics of Africa, and theories of nationalism. Michael, please. Thanks very much. Um, I just want to say thank you to the Common Action Forum for inviting me to join the panel. And even more importantly, I want to say thank you to the Common Action Forum for creating the forum for us to talk about ways of addressing the rise of rivalry politics. Because this creates a sort of a social justice movement to be able to address the rise of right-wing politics. Because social justice needs to happen internationally or locally for there to be human humanity, for nationalism to be able to actually be experienced by all. The main thing really is that nationalism is a very natural thing, just like you have the sense of feeling, eyesight, taste, and all that. Nationalism is a very nat nat natural thing. Anywhere in any country across the world, there's no way you can actually avoid nationalism. In the same way that the topic about whether non-racialism or multiculturalism, a dream deferred, it's a dream that must come true. As much as nationalism is a natural thing, social justice also is a dream that must be achieved, or else we are no longer human beings. And it seems to me that this panel is more or less like a South Africa panel, so I need to uh, locate my explanations into that sphere as well. Um, for me, as an African, my roots from Ghana, living in London as an academic, as an activist, as an analyst on lots of international TV channels, when I look at South Africa, I see that there is a huge responsibility at the moment on the current regime to get things right. And what I mean by that is, I agree that there has to be non-racialism. I also agree that there has to be multiculturalism. But before that, apartheid needs to be reversed. Apartheid needs to be reversed. And when I talk about that, I mean the land reform has to take place thoroughly and entirely. So looking from where I sit, we're expecting so much from this current regime to, as far as I'm concerned, and when I say I, I mean the rest of the world is concerned, every form of legislation that has to be pushed through to make sure that the lands are returned to the black people must be done. If you guys fail us at this point, don't expect the social democracy movement or the rights of rival politics to assist minorities anywhere because this is where the opportunity lies in terms of that. We're expecting that apartheid is reversed, that needs to be corrected, and then we can accommodate non-racialism and multiculturalism. That is a key point. No pressure. no pressure at all, but that is the expectation. We're not expecting Mandela to finish it in a 100-meter sprint, but that is the long-run expectation that you know, we, we want to see. We agree with the multiculturalism, we agree with the non-racialism, but the way nationalism works is a very natural thing. Any, any, any country anywhere in the world, indigenous people, there will be a rise of sentiments from the indigenous against the non-indigenous. That is a, a natural thing which we cannot avoid. And in the same way, there's also an expectation even on the African Union, looking at the African continent and presenting to the rest of the world. It's good that the Continental Free Trade Agreement has now taken place, and we, we, we expect to see that the, this Continental Free Trade Agreement will work for Africa in terms of actually establishing our trade interests against foreign policy. So as much as we as human beings will encourage inclusivity, multiculturalism, and non-racialism. The original ills, 
need to be rectified, because if you haven't rectified that, there's no way ever anything you do will satisfy um, your constituents. If we, cast the, if we flip the coin back to Europe right now, you realize that apart out of, out of the 28 states in the EU, only six at the moment have left-wing governments. All the 22 others have right-wing governments, only all because from the recession in 2009, when there was austerity and all Europeans now have to tighten their belts, any form of immigration, even the least amount of immigrants coming in, are seen as there's not enough resources for us, and even the little that we have immigrants are coming to enjoy that with us. So within the last few decades, 20, 20 years, maybe even 15, 10, there's a huge rise of rivaling politics, all of a sudden because a few immigrants who they can accommodate are coming to their shores. So really, if you flip the coin back, um, <laughs> nationalism is a very natural thing, and the expectation really is that the ills have to be rectified, and then as a result of that, we can in the long term actually fulfill multiracialism and so non-racialism and multiculturalism. So there's quite a huge expectation uh, on South Africa at the moment as we speak. And finally, um, I mean, we know Ramaphosa is the last of the four, Zuma, Mandela, and Mbeki, the four. You know what I mean by the four who were in the particular photograph um, during the time of the struggle. And lots of people see it as you know, if Ramaphosa leaves the scene and the reform hasn't been done, it's going to be very difficult for actually seeing how this has to take place in any way. Um, so I think I'll sort of um, conclude on that point. <laughs> thank you. Michael, thank you very much. We have now half an hour to open for debate, and uh, we will, of course, uh, listen to... To, to the public here, and uh, we come back and we can uh, chat a little bit uh, about some topics that were discussed here. Uh, who would like to start? Uh, so please, we have uh, here the gentleman in the first row. We go first here. Uh, just in order to, to, be, to be brief, uh, let's try to pick up like three questions at, uh, at once, if, if you don't mind. Uh, so first here, and then uh, second there, and the third, uh, Bilal, right? Okay. Okay, uh, my question is for Cheryl, and uh, I think this also came up in the previous panel in the, in the, in the form of leadership structures. <coughs> and Cheryl said, you see that it's important for the young of any organization to have credible political organization structures that plan for succession that can be able to advance what, uh, their causes. And what we've been seeing is generally, if you look at you know the recent movements and everything else, even here in South Africa, like you know fees must fall, roads must fall, or recently in the U.S. with the Parkland shootings with the high school uh, movement that turned into like a proper movement. Um, Occupy Wall Street, and in many young democracies where you have activists who end up getting into politics, sitting in opposition, and then eventually take over government, and they have no idea on how to run a government. What is the solution to inculcating these organizational structures down from the grassroots all the way to the top? Okay, question one, question two now. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to check with Ms. Um, Cheryl Carroll last day because she was there uh, in 1994. Uh, I would like to check on the question, why do we have this dream defeat? Most of the people are saying, uh, 1994 we were quick to sell the Rainbow Nation, to pronounce the Rainbow Nation without letting society to heal. Some are even taking it to an extreme to even say this is the results that we get for forgiving people who did not ask for forgiveness in the first place. It's an extreme case. 
So I would like to check, why do we see this dream being deferred? Is it because of that, your reaction on those two points that I've made? Thank you. Thank you very much. Bilal, please. Okay, um, I just got uh, some questions probably and a few, one or two comments. Um, here, uh, Cheryl, you spoke about sort of the institutionalized racism of the apartheid state and your experience in fighting that kind of racism. Uh, my question is, what kind of racism actually exists in South Africa? Could we call it societal racism that has not been addressed? How do you address the use of racist rhetoric uh, as a political tool as well? And importantly, how does South Africa contribute towards a global debate on destroying racism, essentially? Especially in this era where uh, you know, racism is uh, becoming much more prominent. My third and last question is, um, is the ANC a racist organization? And do we have other political parties that are allowed to function as you know, racist political parties? Uh, and how would that actually function? It, there's a lot in there. If you can address <laughs> one, one or two of the questions, I'll be quite happy. OK, I'm, I'm not going to try it, even though questions were uh, specifically referred to me. I think we've got a very competent no, no, no. panel. Yeah, so I think for all of us. Maybe I'll uh, touch on the, the question of the dream deferred and the rainbow nation and all that. You know, the benefit of hindsight is a very powerful thing, um, and, but a necessary one, because I think one must be able to reflect and see where you could have done things better. So. But I think something which we, even we, tend to forget as we now sit in the Hyatt and debate these things. 1990, 1990 happened, there was a civil war in this country. The other day somebody sent me a video clip of myself, a very younger version of myself. And it was when there was a state of emergency had been around for about three years. And we decided to launch a defiance campaign to defy that state of emergency. And there was a racist election for so-called colors that happened. But as one, the townships, black, so colored, African, whatever, whether they were going through this dummy election or not, the whole of South Africa, progressive South Africa, stood up to oppose it. And we had a press conference, and at this press conference, the point about it was that 29 people were killed that was registered in just one night uh, between Mitchell's Plain and Kailicha. And we called the conference, and it was completely illegal to call the press conference, or to name those people, to actually say that as far as we know, these are the names of 29 people, and we gave the names. We suspected the number was much higher. To this day, we still don't know. But we definitely knew of 29 people who were not only killed on the streets of Kailicha and Mitchell's Plain, but were then taken off to mortuaries, and a few of them were given pop or buried in mass graves. And it's easy now to look back and think whether we should or shouldn't have gone into the negotiations in the form that we did when you're not living under martial law. It was martial law. And as I said, it was, it was quite scary. I, I think of the number of people I know who were killed, some of them right next to me, and it was just a complete fluke that I wasn't killed, that the person next to me was killed. Every week, in every township, we would be burying 10, 12, 20 people. Then there will be a funeral, and at the funeral, they will kill a whole lot more people. Every week, I don't know how people survived, but every week, one or two days at a minimum, poor working people who had jobs stayed away from work to bury their people. Now clearly, that situation could not continue. And it was a question of how do you actually arrest that tide? We also looked around at 
Mozambique, Angola. And I remember how much we celebrated when Zimbabwe, when, Rob, when Robert Mugabe was elected. And of course, many cadres in the ANC said we should never have, we told you we should never have supported Robert Mugabe. Because Zimbabwe was the first country where change came through the ballot and not the bullet. Uh, in Southern Africa, certainly. And, but we also look at the devastation that was wreaked in Angola and Mozambique. Right down to the point where the former colonial powers, before they exited, poured concrete into the sewerage system, into every factory. And our point, the, the, with the question which the leadership had to go through, and remember we fought Nelson Mandela when he came to us with this proposition initially that we had to actually start to talk about talks with the apartheid regime. We were, because we were on the streets at the time. And so I just urge us, it's all very well now when you could, you know, Jacob Zuma, who you, just in case some of you don't know, I oppose and to this day still oppose and try to correct some of what he set us back on. But even in his best of his worst days, people could say the most outrageous things about it. The level of freedom of expression that exists in South Africa exceeds that of what you can do in the UK and in the US. And I challenge anyone to differ with me on that. To this day, even against Jacob Zuma, the things that people can say about him and could get away with even when he was running the country. And so I just, my, my one thing is just to say to us, let us just remember the luxury of the choices we can make today didn't exist in the 80s. And it was a question of whether we went for a scorched earth policy or not. And I remember famous words which Nelson Mandela said to us when we were strenuously opposing him. And he said to us, you know what? You don't negotiate with your friends because he said, how can you speak to the clerk and to Kobe Kutsia? And he said, you, you negotiate with your enemies. You speak to your friends. So the person you say you're going to start negotiating with is by definition an enemy. That person controls elements of state power that you know you can't lay your hands on. And they knew we, the ANC, controlled elements of power. We could call a strike and everybody would stay, the vast majority of workers would stay away from work regardless of the cost to themselves. And so the choices that one can make now and, and I want to go back to, and I want to conclude just to say, you know, it's really about stages that we're going to have to do. We had to pick up from the Congress of the People and the four Congresses, the African National Congress, the Indian Congress. We had to build non-racialism from that point and not say they were wrong to make that decision to have four Congresses. We had to, in fact, say what was our challenge, not what was their challenge that they didn't perform. So I want to just say that uh, there are things that when we look back now, I can name a few, but I'm not going to go into it, and I think Mahmoud and, 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 and Shan spoke about some of that. That with the benefit of hindsight, you think, mm, maybe that was an oversight. But you know what? You were actually in a civil war, not just in a civil war, in a brutal war in this country. Um, yeah. Let me just add to what Cheryl said. I think there's two other developments that we need to look at and consider. The one was the Harari Declaration. Yep. And the Harari Declaration actually set out armed struggle and negotiations and the processes forward. Important that we don't forget mm -hmm. what was said in the Harari Declaration. But equally important internally. Explain what the Harari Declaration huh? is. The OAU, it was the Organization yeah. of African Unity yeah. that mapped the pathway for yeah. Southern Africa at war. I internally, we call what we call the Conference for a Democratic Future. I think you were both mm. there. Yeah. And I remember the words of Dala Omar, the late Dala Omar, very carefully at that particular meeting. He said, we are dying in the trenches, and we must make the decision as to how we go forward into negotiations or not. These were his words. Others were saying, you can't go into negotiations now, armed struggle must continue. But they were not fighting. They were not in the trenches, but they said, please carry on fighting. So he said, who must carry on fighting? Those of us that are dying at the moment, this is our choices. And that is what the CDF 
For the first time, I think we all exposed ourselves as being ANC cadres openly that day that, at, that, uh, at that particular CDF. So I, I think it was important to take that kind of decision to actually go into negotiations. But we also had meetings within communities as a build-up to get people to understand why, were the op what were the options, either negotiations or the scored urge policy, and South Africa would be burned to the ground. So I think those were the, were the important things. But I don't think the three of us are here defending the ANC. I mean, I think we're here as individuals at this particular forum, <laughs> uh, not defending a, a particular political organization as such. This was the history of South Africa. This was the choices that were made by the leadership, and that is what we actually went forward with. But we also review our policy positions continuously. We review what has happened, and we need to look at into the future how we build upon the non-racial concept and basis that we do have. Can I just uh, try two things? One, the, the question about uh, negotiations and, and that, that transition. The, the one thing that I think is not actually understood is how weak the military struggle actually was of, of the ANC. So I headed up a, a, an MK section in the Johannesburg area. It was one of the longest lasting units for over four years. 40 sabotage activities. But the totality of MK operatives in the country at the time, my estimates, no more between 500 to, to 800 people trained and fully equipped. The, SAN, the SADF at the time was over 30,000. And that was just formal. The, 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 those who could still be conscripted would, would have probably traveled that amount. It was the mightiest military force on this continent who could literally march from here across to any country. And it's on that basis that I think people romanticize the whole idea that, that we could have just taken this country by force. Um, change would have come at greater cost, and I'm not sure how, where we would have been today um, had, we, had we gone down that particular route. So, is it the ideal? Well, I think we work with what we have at, at the time. How do we address racist rhetoric? It's a very important question. We had a conference last week trying to address the very same issue. Because on the one hand, we're moving towards legislation, criminalizing it, and so forth. What we haven't as a country dealt with is what else do we do besides putting people into jail? What are the rehabilitative, if possible, measures and mechanisms? When we try to open this debate, members of a political party uh, who were there almost disrupted that entire conversation because their so-called radicalism only says there's one solution, just put them in jail all the time. Now, I, I think we need to be, be moving beyond that. The most useful suggestion that came out was that even those who go to jail, there must be rehabilitative measures within the prison system itself. But if correctional services can't deal with the prisoners who are there now for hardcore prison or hardcore criminal activities, I'm not sure how they're going to deal with racists. But, but I think it, there, there's no answer to that at, at this point in, besides just dealing with these things. I do, however, think what we've seen in the last few years, in the last two years particularly, is a huge public intolerance towards all overt racism. It's unprecedented. You have this chap uh, doing his st stuff on the beach in Greece, and within minutes, so public sanction has been so swift and severe that families disowned him, businesses broke links and all kinds of stuff. And that, I think, is the most positive thing that has happened in the anti-racism fight in the last two years, is public sanction uh, be beyond measure. Um, I, I'm not sure about the ANC, and I think we will not, uh, I, I won't attempt to answer that. Uh, yeah. Maybe, oh, sorry. 
No, carry on. No, that's fine. Michael, no, no, Michael might have something to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, because I, no, I'll come off to you because there's one thing that I did want to say. Yeah. So please, Cheryl, you, you, can, you, can, you can go ahead, Cheryl. Okay, uh, you know, we have seen a resurgence of othering in South Africa mm -hmm. along racial and tribal lines. And it's the thing I said in the beginning. You know, this, it's usually by a minority of to speak very crudely, very bad people who in fact seek to invoke quite emotive su uh, support. Like, and I would say even this, I, I, I'm really deeply concerned, not only about racism as an othering, because I do think that there are people who consciously on the run because of the public sanction and censure and who are now trying to provoke the most base of human instincts. I think we, some people are trying to pull us back on non-racialism as well as non-sexism. There's a piece of legislation, uh, Mohammed, that also about this. There's now legislation to recognize Khoisan communities on the table. I was, I'm very proudly part of a group of people who do use our institutions, and that's the other thing which a lot of people don't do. We have a very progressive parliamentary system which forces parliament to have public hearings on new legislation. It's shocking how few people use it. And I feel very proud of my participation in two pieces of legislation without very much effort. And that is on the media bill to, in fact, I think people are familiar with that. We stopped it in its form that it was. Then there was a piece of thing around traditional leadership that would have placed black rural women at a huge disadvantage that not even urban black women had to live under. And we managed to stop that. It got referred back to the president and it just disappeared into the ether. Well, now some people are trying to whip up this rhetoric again around land and a hugely polarized, quite backward notion of land and restitution and all that. We effectively, someone like the Zulu king is able to be a rent lord and rent out and force people to pay him rent, millions over the years, and he's trying to, to oppose that. But they're also injecting into that Khoisan bill, which is supposed to be a progressive one to recognize that grouping of people, and the legislation itself is quite progressive because it doesn't give them any authority over land allocation. Because land allocation is not just about black, black, white. It's also about women, in fact, and the dreadful anti-democratic steps around women and their status and position in the rural areas. Far more devastating, I think, as a majority group. So they've sneaked in there a thing which says that, and King Zualatini of the Zulu uh, sort of uh, people is trying to reintroduce a notion that women, black women, who fall under his regime can only access land through the proxy of a male member of the society. And people haven't even noticed that they're trying to sneak that piece in. So I just think that it's not just about a backward notion of racism that people are trying to invoke. It's also a frightening level of sexism that impacts on 53% of the population. So I think the question of othering emerges when some very bad people want to evoke the bottom of the barrel, and that's where racism and sexism and Islamophobia, when it's a tiny minority who seek to invoke a narrow sense of nationalism, as a, and then the others are others. So, I, I, sorry, I just thought I had to also just make that point there. I think also we have Section 9 institutions in South Africa that are very strong and very mm. vibrant and should be used. used there's yeah. the Human Rights Commission, there's the Gender Commission, there's a commission on the question of language, culture, and, uh, and yeah. that kind of thing. Sometimes it goes a bit uh, in its own track which I don't understand. But there are courts <laughs> yeah. that hold them accountable too. Yeah, they need to be held accountable as well. But having said that, I think it is also important that those be used effectively mm -hmm. to promote non-racism. And the Human Rights Commission, I think, is very important in that regard. And our Human Rights Commission has got uh, summonsing powers. They can actually subpoena MPs, Parliament. Uh, th they can subpoena the president on that particular issue. So I think that is a, an example that could be used throughout the continent, I think, in, in fact. 
And I think when we're looking at the, uh, the issues such as the Pan-African Parliament and the activism of the Pan-African Parliament uh, that needs to happen, I think it becomes important that these kind of issues now be brought to the attention of the Pan-African Parliament, that they need to actually uh, look at these kind of things. There was also a judgment regarding Muslim marriages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is an important mm -hmm. thing uh, to look at. And I think the scholars in South Africa, the Muslim scholars, are going to have to react to what the judgment said. If not, if they, not, if they don't regulate themselves, they are going to be regulated. Can I just, one last intervention. The, the, the issue here about the global debate on racism. I, I would urge a lot of you to read a report from an organization called Hope Not Hate. What this report basically does, or this organization did, is that they infiltrated the right wing in America. They had two people basically do, infiltrating it, and then thereafter writing up a report. This report, I think, shows just the organized nature of right-wing politics mm -hmm. globally today. They have an incredible connection, and that is why you will see the commonality of positions, irrespective of which country they operate in. What we don't have is the response to this. There is no global connection of anti-racism mm -hmm. organization at all. Europe, you've got the European Network Against Racism. I attended their conference in, in, in Lisbon about three months ago. Very small organizations, but covering a wide area. Out of that are the mass movements, the faith communities, progressive political institutions don't feature in a, in a lot of that kind of stuff. I don't know what is happening in the States, but my sense is that there are, there are some kind of, of, of emergence of structures. On the, con the African continent itself, I don't know what, what exists. I do know, however, is, and, and I was hoping through the, the, this particular forum itself, we would need to be talking about the possibilities of some kind of a global connection or a network, because we need a global movement to counter right-wing uh, fascism today in this world. Thank you very much, Nishan. Let me, let me uh, tell you one example, but before, let me ask you something. Have you ever heard about this phenomena in South America of collective suicide? Please raise your hand if anyone here uh, read anything about it or have read something about it or heard. I think nobody. Uh, so, what happens right now in some native communities in Latin America is, I think, something very important and has a lot to do with uh, our panel here. Uh, so, uh, I'm talking about uh, native communities uh, who need the Mother Earth to leave. Not only to leave their everyday life, but I mean their ontology is related to, 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 to the land and to the Earth. So basically, uh, if they lose the chance to have the nature, uh, it's not just a matter of uh, migrating somewhere else and making uh, their lives. Not like this, because they are living there since thousands of years. Uh, what happens is that with uh, our anthropic actions in the Amazon forest, uh, the ecological balance is changing drastically. And uh, these communities, they start to realize that some animals uh, just vanish. Or uh, some plants also are not present anymore. And uh, in some very specific communities, for example, and this is only one example uh, out of many, uh, the ants, the animals, the insects are very important for them. Uh, they, have, uh, they play a, a sacred role for them. These ants, they, uh, usually, they walk up to the trees and they come uh, to the bottom. And for them, this is the meaning of life. This is the, 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 the meaning that the divinity is still present. If you don't have those trees anymore, if you don't have the ants anymore, uh, for these communities, uh, the spirituality just vanished and they don't have a life after death. So basically what happens is uh, through 
these anthropic interferences in, in the Amazon forest, these communities just uh, find themselves in the situation of suiciding. They kill themselves because this life is not worth it and they don't have another one because uh, the white people already destroyed it. Uh, now Brazil has a fascist government officially. Uh, you know, the former governments tried to protect these communities, uh, just not giving them the property of the land. The land is the property of the union, so it's a common, it's a common uh, property. It belongs to everyone. Now the new government, uh, helped and supported by the international capital, uh, they want to make a lot of money with the Amazon forest. So the beautiful idea they have now is, let's gonna give the property to these communities. Well, since they are very good, so let's give them the chance even either to stay there or to sell, to sell it. So I have no doubt, and I think you will agree with me, that the way the world is, uh, is structured, it's not very hard to convince these people to sell the land and just to convert it into a mercancy. Um, we're not talking about only uh, four years democracy in one place. I mean, we're talking about the Amazon forest, probably the most important uh, zone region in our planet. And we only have one planet. And uh, I think it's very funny when uh, opening the newspaper and uh, reading some of the big new events of uh, Elon Musk or some of these people in uh, Silicon Valley. And uh, all these thoughts they have like, uh, oh, we have to you know, we have to go to another planet, we have to, to colonize the universe. Uh, it's very scary because we probably have only a few decades to fix these problems we are debating here. We don't have much more time. And uh, if these people in Silicon Valley, uh, financed by the international capital, uh, Saudi money, uh, and whatsoever, uh, Basically, we are converting oil money into... Uh, we, we didn't produce oil, right? Uh, it was there. And uh, we converted it into uh, the things actually we, we, we want. And uh, these people are actually having a, uh, doing a very uh, bad profit out of it, out of something that is actually common. So why is it horrifying? Can you imagine? Now, the world is not really living uh, under the, the base of this commonalities. You know, we are here at the Common Action Forum. It's the Common Action because, it's, it's, uh, of course, it's, a, it's an action of everyone, but it's also uh, to, to generate awareness about the commons. I mean, uh, we are not a result of our own efforts. If we are what we are, it's because many people came before us and uh, we are uh, profiting out of it. Um, so what I was uh, going to say is, can you imagine you know, under the current uh, ethical status of our universe, if there is another planet, and if there is another planet only for 0 0.00001 human beings, I mean, I'm sorry to use the example, but this, this entire planet is going to become South Africa of the 80s, 90s. It's going to be like that. So, uh, we have a very important years ahead to fix uh, populism, nationalism will change by itself, uh, but we need to find out what, uh, what are the, the real alternatives, and hopefully before these people can find another planet. Otherwise, uh, our day-to-day our, our, our -day will be a very uh, interesting uh, event in history and period. <laughs> we still have like, time for two questions. Oh, Michael, please. And also, just to come back to what you've just said, as well as something which um, Shinon said before you spoke about the fact that the, the, the right-wing movement is quite global in nature and they're very interconnected. And it, it seems to me that actually to be able to address the rise of, 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 of right-wing politics, that the social democracy movement needs to really innovatively assess, reassess tactics and politics and know how to counteract. Because at the moment, the social base, the voter base of the social democracy movement feels disappointed that the left wing or the social democracy movement have betrayed them. And so some of the votes going to the right wing parties, it's not necessarily that they support right wing policies, but they feel it's like a protest vote. Yeah. 
that the left wing or the, or, or the social democratic movement has failed them. So it's like a protest vote. So I'm thinking that one, one way to address it is actually for the social democratic movement to really have a realistic assessment of how to get the base back, the votes back, in actually doing things which will address um, social justice, interventions, um, redistribution of income, employment, and all that sort of thing. And more importantly that, to be able to get um, people to actually become stakeholders. If you're not involved in the decision-making or the politics, there's no way you're going to get changes in government policy, whether in any other country, wherever. So I think part of the, part of the um, assignment for the left wing, the social democratic movement going forward is actually to be able to encourage people to become stakeholders, to, be, to get involved in the political structures of wherever country that you find yourself in. And every nation will have their own sort of strategy about how to go about it. But, but I think that there has to be some commonality or common interests, um, people of like-mindedness across the whole left-wing movement to also pull together to counteract the rise of the right wing politics. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Bilal, one last question. Uh, just in terms of uh, what we were discussing, I think, you know, in 2001, we attended the World Racism Conference, and for me, that was, you know, a huge marker. Uh, subsequently, I think, you know, it was uh, uh, decommissioned, let's say. What are the opportunities, really, in the current global situation to actually pursue actively the reinstatement of you know, a World Racism Conference, uh, maybe under the auspices of the UN, etc. cetera. Uh, it's just an idea. The, 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 the UN has a review of, of, of the Durban Conference, I think every two or three years. Mm -hmm. um, so, so they do meet. Three years. They do have, I think, an annual session um, analyzing the state of racism and, and, and what's really in the world. It, it doesn't have that kind of global character that I think the, the World Conference here had. What, however, has happened from that World Conference is a whole range of states were meant to have developed country plans to combat racism. Um, a number of them have. South Africa, we are finalizing ours now. So, I think in that is, 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 a, is an idea of how serious we, we took this issue. But I, I, I'm not sure about when, whether the UN has intentions to, to do something like that again. Uh, it, it's an idea worth pursuing. But I think it's really, in, it's, it's up to movements who are working on this issue across the world with progressive political institutions, faith-based organizations, to find ways of actually constituting themselves. Because that, that conference had the downfall of being government-led. Uh, and once you get caught up within the processes of government itself, I think the actions mm. become very limited. Mm. Well, last question there. Very, very short, and then... Uh, my name is Francis. I'm not so sure if it's going to be short. But we, the population of South Africa is around uh, 58 million. And then you have um, a team who gets more than 60 million uh, per annum. Now, my question is, we talk about um, anti-racism, multiracialism. What are we going to talk about anti-poverty? If you can give somebody more than 60 million to look after his family, certainly you can give each family 100,000 so that they don't go and look for food in the dustbin. Like Shemini observed today, we are heading towards disaster. People are hungry and are getting angry because you see money being showered to individuals while others are looking for food in the dustbin. 
who would like to make uh, that's any a comment? Comment. That's a comment. That's a comment. Yeah. Would you, uh, you also like to uh, add something to it? Maybe, maybe I'll just add to, to some of what you, your thoughts were. Uh, it's exactly that, that globally there's more money being made, individual companies and whatever might be suffering losses. But we have this thing called globalization that is bringing huge amount of innovation, electric, driverless cars, all sorts of things. And I think one of the reasons why we, the world is in the mess that they are, it's exactly what the last speaker just mentioned. This is not something that generally all of humankind or the majority of humankind is benefiting from these huge innovations that humanity is capable of today. That in fact, if anything, it's entrenching the fact that benefits accrue with on a micro level in a country like South Africa where change is bringing benefits to a minority of people or whether it's a global phenomenon. And I think this has to be something wrong when the generations today, it's easy for us to be judgmental. We forget that Brazil has actually had the democratic elections. Trump was elected democratic. You can have your say about the American process or not, Philippines and what's his name, Duterte. How, we, we can be very judgmental, but how could people vote for these people? And it's, we are in people as well. The fact of the matter is, I think people are cocking a snook at the establishment. It's not just the social democrats who are losing votes. Even the Republicans, the establishment parties, people believe have failed them. And it's in partly linked to the thing that came up with the youth panel. The institutions today are inappropriate to in fact deal with how you take what is possible today and make it work for everyone. So as a consequence, the powerful are able to arrogate to themselves all the benefits of the change that should be renegotiated for how it works for the rest of the world. So I think that the question of poverty, there is growing inequality as there is growing advantages, the free movement of people, goods and services is not benefiting the poorest of the poor. In fact, they are being, the ones being shortchanged are being stopped from free movement. They are being stopped from accessing the benefits that uh, electrified cars in Silicon Valley has. People, landless people in the Amazon are not benefiting from the ability to be able to send people to Mars the allocation of resources globally. And I think that that is the challenge that faces people like us. Whether we like it or not, we're part of that 1% of the beneficiaries of these advances. And we're part of the people who are not making it work for poor people. Even to money. You know, we're actually part of a minority of people who make it to university. And so I think that it is the challenge that the institutions today are failing to translate the advances and in fact entrenching the fact that the advances are played purely for the benefit of those who are in power already. And um, just to add to that, how do you address poverty, how do you address inequality? You have to address the institutions or the yep. existing structures that have made it happen in the first place racism, neocolonialism, prejudices, whatever. So, for example, even at the moment, the International Organization for Migration is having difficulty to provide a coherent migration policy mm. for um, people to be able to move across borders, etc. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, it's actually addressing the existing institutions that have caused the, the poverty in the first place across the board in all spheres. Um, so, for example, even in South Africa, we, we, we were aware that in universities, black students are marked down. It's even difficult for black students to actually get entry into the US in the first place. And once you get there, you're not going to get the grades that match your actual level of intelligence because the, the marking scheme and actually everything goes against you one way or the other. So there has to be ways of actually addressing university structures and the pattern of actually dealing with students and all that sort of thing so that in the end you get a change of results. So, so, so we're talking about addressing the existing institutions, whatever they are in whichever manner will be able to negate 
inequality and social injustice. Um, so that will be something which cut across the board if you want to deal with poverty or if you want to address inequality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much all. Thank you very much, Cheryl, Nisham, Mohammed, Michael. Thank you very much all for being here with us today. Uh, I would like now to uh, give stage to uh, our Master of Ceremonies, uh, Mr. Sami Zaydan. Thank you very much indeed. A warm round for uh, Rafael and our panel here. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that discussion. Thank you for your participation and engagement. It's been a fantastic day of engagement and panel discussions. I think we've had uh, a lot of issues raised, a lot of food for thought. A few people came up to me um, during the various breaks and said, you know, how do we take these discussions forward? We come every year to CAF and we discuss, but these ideas should bear some fruit. And so just to let people know, the board is on the ball when it comes to that issue and has plans to form committees that will work through these sorts of issues all throughout the year and produce concrete proposals and papers. So your um, observations are well placed and are being taken into consideration and, and hopefully in the not too distant future there will be new CAF initiatives announced that will allow us to take these sort of discussions deeper and further with panels of experts, with renowned names in certain specializations from around the world, people who have a good track record and credibility working on various topics around the whole year, producing papers that can be then presented perhaps to policymakers and say, hey, this is an alternative way of meeting some of the challenges. So these discussions are very fruitful and will lead to other things. Let me invite up to the stage to deliver the closing remarks to Mbiza Fakuda, Deputy Chairperson of the Common Action Forum and the 2018 Annual Forum Coordinator. Let's welcome him. Thank you very much, Sami. Um, just a few words of thanks. Uh, I'd like to thank, first of all, the Board of Common, of Common Action Forum for affording us this opportunity to meet in Johannesburg, the first Global South city um, at which the Common Action Forum was hosted. I'd like to thank the participators who uh, sacrificed their time to come here. Uh, I'd like to thank the Mail and Guardian uh, that has been very supportive. Unfortunately, the two uh, foot soldiers from the Mail and Garden couldn't make it today, Denise and Matlodi, special thanks to them. I'd like to also thank uh, Shark Forum uh, for also assisting, particularly for those. Uh, she's not here. She's been working tirelessly to ensure that we, 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 we get here or got here safe. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Ahmed Katwada Foundation, uh, uh, Zakira, who's also been very helpful uh, in making sure that this conference uh, took place. There are a few things that were said, and one of them, of course, is the um, proposal that we take this forward. Uh, we are certainly going to take it forward, and I, th I like what Shen said about uh, establishing a global network or platform that will look at uh, pushing forward the, uh, this campaign of non-racial politics. But there's something else that I think is important. You know, when I was growing up in, in Soweto, uh, we used to have something called, it was a campaign called the Zepit and the Zibi Can. Uh, and there was a, uh, I think it was a, it was a, an ostrich, it used to be say like Zepit and the Zibi, Zepit and the Zibi Can. And it was a, it was a, uh, a Keep South Africa Clean campaign. So do not litter, it was not an anti-littering campaign. And that was drummed into our heads through the then uh, national broadcaster, which is now the public broadcaster, SABC. It was drummed into our heads, and as a result, I don't litter. I keep litter in my car, because I was told by Mr. Zibi not to litter. And I think uh, non-racialism as a campaign 
um, should be that. It should become part of that campaign, a continual campaign. And it should be embraced by the public broadcaster in ensuring that we continue with this campaign because it's not a, a part-time um, campaign or a, a part-time movement. I know that the speakers try to academize and complicate the issue of non-racialism. I'm proud to say that uh, one of my mentor and the person who actually converted me, well, two of them are here. One converted me away from nationalism or ultra African nationalism, and the other one helped me to understand non-racial politics, which is uh, Mohamed Dango and Wadakhamfa, respectively, I hear. And one of the simple things that taught me was basically to be constantly vigilant, you know, just to be constantly vigilant of anything that's racist, and to be constantly vigilant of anything that is nationalistic and backward. Uh, I know uh, we had a, a nice chat with Michael Amoa about the inev inevitability of nationalism within certain um, platforms. But I like to believe that it can be achieved. And the reason why I chose the word deferred is because unfortunately our uh, glorious movement, which has turned into an organization and a party, has forgotten what Congress politics were all about. Um, we once gave a nice long lecture when I was about 16 years old in Soweto about the difference between Pan-Africanism and non-racial politics. We understood what it was. It was no complication. Uh, and um, to an extent, kind of, you know, uh, when I had the panelists, most of whom are from the, well, all of them were, except for Michael, uh, members of the politics of the Congress politics or Congress movement, uh, trying to clarify what it meant. Uh, those days we understood what it meant. There was a big difference. And for those of us who were susceptible to joining political organizations, it wasn't difficult for us to choose between Pan-Africanist Congress and African National Congress. And it was not because of the looks of the faces, but because of ideological understanding. So when Faith talked about the ignorance in terms of political understanding, I, I, I take that, and it's very important, because we were conscientized. Yeah, I couldn't speak proper English those days, but we understood the difference. Uh, you didn't have to convince me the difference between Pan-Africanism and, 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 and the non-racial politics which characterize uh, the African National Congress, which I was a member of before I became a journalist. Now I'm a journalist, I'm objective. Um, well, I was a journalist, but I'm, I'm still objective. And um, so we were very clear about the, those differences. We didn't have to convince us. Uh, but sadly, over the years, of course, uh, some of the people who led uh, the glorious movement were turned a blind eye when people were wearing 100% Zulu T-shirts in the gathering of the ANC, and nobody saw anything wrong with it. Nobody condemned it, and then uh, the next time when I went to cover the ANC conference in Bloemfontein, people were wearing 100% Swana, 100% Bedi, and again, we were all singing together, clapping, and not understanding the dangerous trappings of that. And we hope that with the new era of Tumamina, <laughs> we are going to go back into understanding the differences and let people understand that you know, part and parcel of uh, uh, success was non-racial politics. You know, uh, part and parcel of what we are as a people in this country uh, and uh, part and parcel of who are celebrating this year and uh, Nelson Mandela who went once uh, early days of the democracy in 1986 and we were asked to sing the national anthem and all of us sang Gosa Sigelel Africa and he stood up and said, oh, stop, sing it again. Uh, and yet in later years within the ANC structures, again at the conference of the ANC, conferences of the ANC, people confident to stood up and they sang Gosa Sigilel Africa without singing the South African national anthem. And there was a spin to say Gosa Sigilel Africa was the national anthem of the ANC. I don't know who embraced that. Uh, but these are the things that are minor but very important and dangerous.
uh, and we need to be constantly uh, aware of them. So with those few words, um, I'm up for the challenge and I'm, 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 I'm here and hopefully with the permission of uh, the powers that be, uh, we'd like to be part and parcel of this new movement that we seek to create. And it shouldn't be just South Africa. And Common Action Forum is committed in, uh, to provide a platform that we ensure that this non-racial pushing back the frontiers of right-wing politics, uh, we provide a platform to make sure that we promote that. As, uh, uh, as I close, I would like to conclude with what Connelliza Wright said, not my favorite person in the world, but she said something really interesting, interesting at the time when she was the National Security Advisor to Mr. George Bush, uh, asked about China, uh, whether we're not fearful that China will eventually turn us into lunch and dinner. Um, and um, she said that, well, she doesn't care who actually lead the world, as long as that person who leads understand where we are as human beings, the kind of achievements that we've gained over the years. So whoever takes over must take us forward from there. Uh, but what we see happening at the moment, unfortunately, people that are taking over are not taking us forward, but taking us backward. So with those few words, thanks very much. And uh, we have tea and coffee as a final gesture of appreciation. And uh, may you have safe uh, journeys home and those who are flying uh, have safe flights. And uh, hope to see you again at the next uh, Common Action from Platform. Thank you.